Jesus replied to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall live even if they die. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. These words were spoken by the Lord to comfort Martha after the unexpected death of her brother Lazarus. But they are more than just words spoken to a grieving woman. They are a declaration by the eternal God himself that although physical death awaits everyone, it is not the end. Life awaits us in Christ Jesus. With these words, I welcome you to this podcast service from the Potchester Methodist Church. My name is Edward Brown, and I'm the minister with pastoral charge of this congregation. Let us pray. Eternal God, you who are Father and Creator of all life, accept our praises today as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of your Son on that Sunday in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. It is one of the great mysteries that you as the unlimited, all-powerful, all-knowing and eternal God should become a man subject to the laws of nature that you had created yourself and then suffer before dying as all men do. It is a marvel too great for mortal minds to comprehend that you did so because of your love for us, a love that is boundless in grace and compassion and forgiveness. O Lord Jesus Christ, we come to praise you today for the resurrection life that you have promised to all who believe in you and who accept your death on the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of their sins. Raise us, we pray, to a life eternal in your presence, a life of holiness and service to the Heavenly Father. O Lord Jesus, we entreat you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that we might be governed by the same love that directed your life, that we might love our Heavenly Father with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength and come to love our neighbours as we love our own lives. O Lord Holy Spirit, you proceed from the Father and the Son. You are one with them in essence and mission. Accept our adoration. O precious Spirit, we who are among those redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, ask that you speak daily into our lives to guide us and direct us to live to the glory of the kingdom of God. O Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray these things and join in the prayer that has united the fellowship of believers for 2,000 years. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn for today is by the Reverend Samuel Medley. He was a Baptist minister who had entered the ministry after having first been a sailor in the Royal Navy, from which he had been honorably discharged after having been injured in the Battle of Lagos in 1759. After that, he ran his own school in London for a number of years until he answered the call to first preach in 1766 and then the full-time ministry the following year. He later moved to Liverpool, where his background as a former sailor made him very acceptable to the mariners of that port city among whom he worked for some time. He died in 1799, aged 61. Among the 20 or so hymns that he wrote is this beautiful resurrection hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. It is hymn number 235 in the Methodist hymnal. I know that my Redeemer lives, what joy the blessed assurance gives. He lives, he lives who once was dead, he lives my everlasting head. He lives to bless me with his love, he lives to plead for me above. He lives my hungry soul to feed. He lives to help in time of need. He lives and grants me daily breath. He lives and I shall conquer death. 
He lives my mansion to prepare. He lives to lead me safely there. He lives all glory to his name. He lives my saviour still the same. What joy the blessed assurance gives. I know that my redeemer lives. Today's scripture is taken from Mark chapter 16, and I read from verse 1. After the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices to go and anoint the body of Jesus. Very early on Sunday morning, at sunrise, they went to the tomb. On the way they said to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? It was a very large stone. Then they looked up and saw that the stone had already been rolled back. So they entered the tomb, where they saw a young man sitting on the right, wearing a white robe, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised. Look, here is the place where they put him. Now go and give this message to his disciples, including Peter. He is going to Galilee ahead of you. There you will see him, just as he told you. May God bless the scripture to our understanding. Amen. My message for today is entitled, God in Jesus always goes ahead of us. The Dead great leaders of history are divided into two groups. The first group comprises those who are buried and remained there in their tomb. The burial sites of many of these leaders is known, and those places are venerated, respected, and in many cases visited by historians, admirers, and tourists. Some of the great leaders' final place of rest has been lost to our records. But because those men and women were never seen again, we can be certain that they are still dead. Then we have the other group. Actually, it can't be considered as a group because it only has a single entry. It is the empty tomb of a young Jewish rabbi from Nazareth in Galilee, Jesus, the son of Joseph, who had been executed by the Roman authorities in Jerusalem for the crime of being the king of the Jews. But people will say, History is full of the records of empty tombs, raided by grave robbers and archaeologists alike. Aha! But here is the difference. What makes this entry unique is that the Bible records that by the time the sun rose on the third day after his burial, that Jesus had abandoned his own tomb, that he had walked out of it and immediately began to encounter his followers. Unlike any other tomb, Jesus' empty tomb declares boldly that Christ the Saviour lives. When Jesus, their Lord and Master, had been arrested, humiliated, degraded, brutalized, and executed only days before, the disciples' faith had been shattered. And by the disciples, I don't just mean the eleven apostles. I mean every man, woman, and child that had looked to Jesus for guidance and direction. They had believed that he was the promised Messiah, that he would free the nation from foreign bondage, that he would restore the purity of the worship that had been lost to the Jewish religion, and that he would reignite the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in people's hearts, and that there would be a spiritual revival that would revitalize the Jewish faith. It was for this reason that Jesus knew that they needed to see him soon after his resurrection. He knew they desperately needed to have new images and memories to overlie those from that horrible Friday. Over the 40 days between Resurrection Sunday and his ascension, 
Jesus would appear so many times and to so many people in all sorts of circumstances and places that they would never doubt that he had triumphed over life and history and death itself. In the most emphatic way, Christ Jesus' resurrection declared the truth that the Jewish leaders had in their blindness refused to acknowledge and which they used as the damning argument against him, namely that he truly was the Son of God. But the resurrection speaks of other triumphs as well. In this event, we see how the Lord is triumphant over human political structures and their evil. When an examination of the political forces aligned against Jesus is made, the human conclusion must be that he stood no chance of success in any form. The Roman Empire was at that moment seamlessly united with the most powerful Jewish ruling body, the Sanhedrin, something that had never happened before during the almost 90-odd years of Roman rule. By walking from the tomb, Jesus declared his triumph over Rome's emperor and Jerusalem's high priesthood. Both would fall forever. Since that time, there have many cases where it appeared that the political machine of some or other country must be victorious over Christ. But every one of those evil governments has fallen. The same has been true of governments that supposedly avowed Christian principles, but did not honor Jesus as Lord. Let kings and governments that treat all faiths as equal to the Christian faith take note. They will surely fall at his hand, for God tolerates no rivals, to his right to rule. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the world of the dead revealed his triumph over sin and its rightful wages, which, as Paul wrote, is death. Throughout his ministry, Christ had declared people to be freed from their sin. And the Jewish leaders had bitterly rejected those pronouncements because they rightly pointed out that only God could forgive sin. By his resurrection, Jesus Christ's absolute purity and sinlessness, God's state of perfect holiness in him, was publicized in a way that could not be challenged. Jesus is God, and as such, has the perfect right to forgive the sin of anyone, anywhere, anytime, forever. Christ Jesus' resurrection was the ultimate triumph over Satan and his servants. Jesus' ministry had resulted in many people being freed from the power of the dark forces of evil. Adults and children alike had been restored to full humanity by the words of the Master when he ordered their foul infestations into the abyss. But none of Jesus' followers had truly understood the infiniteness of his sovereignty until he rose under his own power from the grave. Jesus had defeated all the might that the legions of darkness could muster against him. Satan and his illegitimate reign over the earth since the time of Adam and Eve's fall was over forever. Jesus' resurrection was God's triumph over our greatest enemy, death, and its showcase, the grave. Never again would the sons of Adam or the daughters of Eve have cause to fear death. Because we now know that it is not the end. There is the promise of eternal life to all who choose to link their destinies to that of the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. Within a very short time, the disciples would learn the most wonderful truth. Namely, that Jesus' resurrection power was available to his followers. Ten days after their Lord's ascension, the disciples would be filled with the Holy Spirit and Peter and the other disciples would perform many miracles in the name of Jesus. So much so that Paul later wrote to the church in Ephesus in chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. And how very great is God's power at work in us who believe. This power is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at his right side in his heavenly world. The writer of Hebrews expressed a similar thought in chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. God has raised from death our Lord Jesus, who is the great shepherd of the sheep, as the result of his sacrificial death, 
by which the eternal covenant is sealed. May the God of peace provide you with every good thing you need in order to do his will. And may he, through Jesus Christ, do in us what pleases him. And to Christ be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us start today to pray earnestly that God will once again pour out his power on his faithful servants, us, that we might serve him in spirit, truth, and power. In the instruction to the disciples, the angel told them they were to follow their Lord Jesus to Galilee and would see him there. The wonderful truth is that even though he commissions us to go out for him, that Jesus is always with us and still goes ahead of us. Jesus is always with us. He is with us whether we are alone in the time of personal prayer or as many prisoners for him are attested with them in their cells in accordance to his promise as found at the end of Matthew. I will be with you always to the end of the age. He is also with us in the midst of a worshipping church community. Earlier in his teachings to the disciples, he had prepared them for times of fellowship with him and each other saying, For where two or three come together in my name, I am there with them. That was in Matthew 18 verse 20. In his presence, we will find the Lord Jesus will lead us as he led his disciples to mountaintops of wonder and prayer. Such events should be far more common than they are in the church. And I remember with delight hearing teenagers declare the best part of an Easter camp they'd attended was the time spent in prayer and praise. The Lord Jesus will lead us into valleys to serve him by serving his people. In his name and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we will be vessels through which Jesus will heal and restore broken spirits and bodies and relationships. Again, I remember a Bible study where a young woman's curved spine was straightened and the healing verified by her orthopedic specialist. And I thank you, Marilyn, for giving me permission to share your name about this miracle that changed your life. And there are others that I experienced where torn ligaments were healed, restoring the power to walk. And once an old man's hearing returned in our service so that he could mix freely with the community again. Jesus goes before us, and if we follow in faith, he will use us to glorify his Father in heaven. The Lord Jesus goes before us to warn us of temptations that may lie in wait for us. And these warnings are to be found in his scriptures. And once we have internalized those scriptures, he speaks through our informed consciences about what is dangerous to us as his people. He also gives us power through his Holy Spirit to overcome those temptations and to defeat them. Christ Jesus is with us in our times of sorrow. He understands grief perhaps better than we do and will comfort us during those times, just as he did to Martha and Mary of Bethany after their brother Lazarus had died. He shared their sadness and even cried just minutes before he raised Lazarus to life again. The Lord Jesus also gave a wonderful promise to his followers that he was going ahead of them to prepare a place of eternal glory for them and us and that he would return for his people. For those of our beloved ones who have gone before us, the reality of that place is already true. But the scriptures also promise that at some time yet to be decided by God, that his son Jesus will return in glory for his church still here on earth. And so to conclude, Jesus Christ, the eternal and ever-present one, challenges us to enter into a deeper relationship and a greater faith in him. He calls us, as he did the disciples of old, to greater faithfulness in our service to his heavenly Father. We will find, as generations of our Christian forefathers have found, that when we respond to his loving, living presence, that our religion is transformed into relationship. Where once the Bible was dry, it will become a source of delight, as the pages come alive with God's message for us as individuals. We will find the time spent in worship become more vital, and at such times we wish that it could continue forever. Prayer will no longer become a burden and difficult. It becomes easy as sharing time with an old friend, 
and life itself becomes richer and more abundant in every way. May God's grace be upon us. I close with a Trinitarian benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.